thanks, Phil, and uh, thanks everyone for sticking it out for day three. This is always a tough, uh, tough slot to fill, so we're going to try and keep it lively and interesting. Um, thank you to the folks who did our little assignment this morning, the, the more and less assignment, so we'll feed back on that. But I'm going to uh, ask the panelists to come up, uh, Nigel Wallace, Joe Pucciarelli, and Mega Kumar. Thanks, thanks for joining me on stage, everyone. So it's been a great couple of days. Uh, I really love the discussion that we have. The formal sessions are great too, but I think uh, some of the best takeaways are, are the one-on-ones and, and the dinner conversations and, and those types of informal discussions where you start to learn from each other. So uh, one of the things that we wanted to do is, is ask the analyst team who attend many conferences and also observe the market from you know, a, a different vantage point, uh, being a, a perspective uh, looking at technology in the industry from afar so we, we can have a, a different lens and provide some of that perspective. So um, let's start with uh, Nigel. Um, what are some of the biggest aha moments that you had on, on the last couple of days at, at Engage? Sure. And so what's funny is uh, between the conversations I've been talking so much I've actually lost my voice, which is <laughs> awkward when you're the panelist. But uh, has nothing to it's do a with good the sign. Beer. <laughs> nothing to do with the beer or last night or anything. No, <laughs> nothing. It's... Clearly, that's you know correlation, not causation. Um, so it, it's interesting. One of the things that really strikes home is we talk a lot about the new technologies. What's on the, the riding the hype cycle? Um, you know, it's one of my part of my job is like, hey, new cool thing. How can I show you the shiny object? Um, and that grabs the attention really easily of a lot of headlines. But to make any of that work comes back down to culture and the whole idea of of culture eating strategy for breakfast is so true. And, and one of the things that was a, a hob moment that brought it back home to me was, uh, was Phil. When he's like, yeah, it, it, great idea, we're gonna go to DevOps, I'm really stoked about Agile, but my, bottom, my, my budget's waterfall. And like, oh, and I, we write a lot about these changes, like everybody should move to DevOps without thinking about the practical realities of if the rest of your company isn't making that journey with you or you're dragging them forward, the CFO has a lot more clout than most organizations necessarily than the CIO, and, and you need to be able to march the culture along with you. If you get too far ahead of it, then the elastic will snap. Um, and so that was a really interesting aha for me is just hearing about the, right, you can't just go off because it's a good idea to do DevOps. You've actually got to think through all the background politics and machinations, and that's not a bad thing. If you don't do that, it's going to fail for other reasons, not the technology. Yeah, great point. The budgeting challenge hasn't gone away, and we've been talking about it for a few years. Joe, what, what do you think? What are uh, some of the key learnings or aha moments for you? You know, um, I always start my day before I have to get on stage by scanning the news because I never want to get on stage and, and have somebody saying from the back of the room, didn't you know so-and-so got bought out by such-and-such? -such? This morning, the lead item on a number of the business sites was that we are in the process of setting a worldwide record for CEO turnover. Now remember I started my presentation by saying these are the imperatives, this is what the senior leadership, this is what CEOs are challenging us as technology leaders to do? Well, so far this year, 272 of them have bit the dust. Now, that is actually a quite predictable outcome. You know, we sit here and we talk about change and um, there's many manifestations of that, but exec accelerating executive turnover at the very top is real. And what it does is, to me, it highlights and crystallizes the imperatives that we have as, as leaders of, uh, with a re responsibility and accountability to our teams and, and to the people that are uh, in the organization. Um, there's a lot coming. Now, now given that, um, when I reflect on the event, there were a couple of moments that really stood out for me. Um, I, I was, I'm always amazed by what a determined um, and motivated person can do with practically nothing. And Helen, you won that award. So I think Helen deserves a, a round of applause. I absolutely do. Um, the amount of resources we squander in our organizations um, puts to shame um, what she's able to accomplish um, through determination and grit. And I, I think if, uh, if that doesn't challenge us personally to higher goals, and I don't know what, what we could do. Um, you know, um, the other presentation, the other comment, I, I, I don't see her in the room. Uh, 
Callie's um, idea I've never heard before where she talked about doing a video of the process before and after. My gosh, what a simple thing to do. How profoundly impactful that is. Just, I mean, you can do it with a phone, for gosh sakes. It's not like we need video production studios, and it's the classic case. Um, very quickly, um, probably one of the most um, important research projects I worked on, we actually ended up editing down focus group comments that went to the board of directors for a Fortune 20 company. Because the video is so compelling. And, and, and what Callie is doing, what Callie did with that technique, I think is something all of us should, um, should tuck away. Because we are, you know, there is a component of marketing in our roles. We have to compel and convince people to act in this context, context of, of swirling change and impending in, in change. Yeah, we know video is so important in marketing externally. And just to hear it say that's really important internally, it's all about kind of convincing and, and you know, dr driving that emotion through that, that medium. Um, over to you, Mega. Okay. Um, now, from all the presentations, and I think uh, what was more interesting was uh, something that came, out, came across from all the panels was the sheer fact that a lot of people felt that they were still stuck in silos. It was either IT being siloed from the business or different business groups being siloed from each other. The fact that a lot of the people who were on the panel were talking about how can we better integrate all the ideas? How can we better get the board to understand what we're doing? And I think um, it was aha for me because I was thinking that, wait, if technology is the business right now, I mean, I, I can't imagine a single business that's not dependent on tech. The fact that the CIO has to still market themselves up also tells you how much education. It's not, the, it's not just your teams that have to upskill themselves. It also tells you how much the board has to upskill themselves. Right? So I, I kind of feel like there's a lot of onus even on the business to try and understand what is it that technology can do for me to do my job better. Putting all the stress on the CIO and the IT leader or the operational leader, I feel like is so easy, to, uh, it's like somebody having a fall guy in the process, right? So I feel like that is something that a lot of organizations need to think about, right? How does the board educate themselves so they realize, how do I stay relevant to the customer? So that was my aha moment. So Great, thank thanks. Um, we're gonna go to some of the notes I gathered this morning. So last night, um, Mega and Nigel and I thought, how can we make this interesting? We thought of this very informal survey. It would have been nice to use uh, some tools, but hey, this is handcrafted and, and it worked really fast, right? We didn't have to pilot. Um, so what, what do people want to hear more of? And some of them will, will just jump off and comment. Um, the best, one, the funniest one, of course, was we want more Helen. Um, so we got to, Nigel said, uh, we're gonna have to figure out how to scale you, so. Uh, um, more AI, and I think that, that comment probably came before our first panel, so we got some good stuff, really good stuff this morning. Um, but then there's getting into the, you know, the, some of the tougher stuff, like master data management, um, not the sexy front end stuff. Um, data analytics, privacy laws, uh, RPA, which we heard a little bit about. Um, any comments from, from the folks on, on the panel? Yeah, I mean, what gets the attention of <clears throat> the people you work with and report to, bringing up machine learning, it's interesting, it's sexy. If your data is crap, it will get crap results. Um, and garbage in, garbage out. That hasn't changed in 30 years. But getting budget to actually grind through a full MDM process is still really difficult. Um, and as a whole, it's amazing how the, the plumbing and the infrastructure behind these sexy interfaces gets neglected. And you know that, it's a daily battle you face. But it's funny because the industry analyst side, we often get distracted again by the shiny objects. But if your base core systems aren't up to speed, throwing you know lipstick on that pig is not going to make it a smarter pig. So, you know, it, it's a good point about the MDM stuff inside. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And people also want to hear more about failures. And I think uh, JP, you heard that in your research study as well of CIOs. So, uh, it's really hard to to get people to come forward with projects that failed. You know, fa failing fast is a kind of a mantra we're seeing in in the tech world, but. Um, uh, I would encourage everyone in, in a you know, comfortable setting, uh, NDA or what have you, to, to be able to share more of that with you because I think there's, there's good learnings there. 
I mean, culturally, Canada and Canadian businesses don't like discussing failures. It has a negative impact on the brand, on the marketplace, the stock place, your promotion, or not promotion. Um, in Silicon Valley mentality, failing is understood as part of the process of trying to experiment. Um, not all experiments are gonna work. And so it's not seen that you have failed personally. You tried something that didn't work, try again. At least you're entrepreneurial. And in Canada, there's so few stories or an, uh, understanding why tech is critical to process in business success and, and hasn't played out. And I can think of a couple of stories in the mainstream media. Target, that was well explained in a couple of places. The other one would be Slack. How many of you use Slack in your job? Right? So Slack is one of the fastest growing collaboration tools in the world. It, you know why it exists. It's the last remnant piece of a failed video game. Oh, really? Stuart Butterfield had a multi-channel discussion for the developers on his team that he built from scratch because he hated working with Skype, um, which fair, well, I get it. Um, so he built that himself. They had this multiplayer game that went through billions of dollars of venture, or sorry, hundreds of millions of dollars of venture capital and never landed. It fired everybody but the last 13 people. And the one thing they kept from it was Slack, the channel back and forth, which is now a multi-billion dollar IPO. But the whole path to how they got there doesn't look as pretty as the multi-billion IPO. It was a series of failures and failures and failures. And the lessons learned from that is what eventually made Slack successful. But we don't tend to talk about that in Canadian marketplace. It's just not what we do. And the repercussions to you personally of talking about failure, you don't want to be the first one to do it. But things like FailCon in the US have been quite successful because people are able to articulate what they did wrong without feeling like that's going to be a repercussion on them. It's a learning that will bring to the next job so they won't make that mistake again. And you won't make it either because they made it for you. But we, we, we historically haven't done that. Yeah. Um, one of the things that uh, Joe put together was a, a slide that will help visualize some of the things that he's thinking about. Um, and there's a lot of topics also that people wanted to hear more of. There's a couple more that asking about data privacy, regulations, breach response, planning, DevOps, which you touched on uh, on day one, Joe. But why don't we go to that uh, slide and, and you can give an overview of, of um, how this might help the team as sure. they go into their next few days. So if you remember, um, this was my next to last slide and I said, you know, I challenge you, print out a copy of this and as you think about your plan, you know, what is, what is the plan for the future of customers and future of intelligence, future of work, future of operations? So if I take you to the next slide, what I did is I, I started at the top and I said, okay, well, you know, as you think, I personally think in to-do lists, okay, there's short, medium, and long-term to-do lists. So what are your strategies? What are gonna be your pilots for 2020? And what are you gonna move into production? Okay, that's what really matters. The first two are hot air and, and slideware. It's the third one that's where the money is. So first question for you is, as you think about your plan for 2020, what's in each of those first three categories? And then what I did is I modified this just a little bit. I included the first four. I pulled out culture. I put in infrastructure. Um, and I'll start with that just because we're CIOs. Um, at this point in the game, the hosting strategy should be, you should have poured concrete. You should have concrete down. Okay, certainly by the end of 2020, you need poured concrete with good footings under it. Okay, even if you haven't fully implemented. You know, what's your legacy, what's your plan for, your, for apps? What, what are you gonna do with all the legacy apps? Okay, most of you have a few. Which new apps are you gonna focus on and, and what are you gonna do in terms of app rationalization for 2020? Because when you go into 2021, that battle's gotta be fought and won. And then finally, maybe this is the year that we try to go from a reactive security strategy to a proactive security strategy. Now I'm just throwing that out there as an idea. I might be reaching too far, but um, personally, if I was um, on the other side, if I was on the CIO side, I would be frustrated with my strategy being evaluated by how much money I spent on it as opposed to the outcomes I was able to achieve. So I'm just voicing my own opinion. You look at the other four categories, I, I just put some questions. So again, as CIOs, as senior technology leaders, you know, what are your customers' needs gonna be in 24 months? Not are, what are they today? You've gotta to design for what your customers are gonna need 12, 24 months out so that your delivery can intercept with their requirement. You can't just constantly be chasing them, okay? 
The other thing is, is that as your business grows, your largest customers are probably not the ones you should be asking what you need. It's the new customers that are rising in the portfolio that are gonna help fuel your growth. So if you just talk to your biggest customers, you're not gonna help the business grow. You've gotta to talk to the rising customers. New products, new requirements. Remember that was something we saw CI was working on. We've already touched on the future of intelligence, whether it's, you know, what's your BI analytics strategy? You definitely should have something in pilot on AI, okay? You need to be piloting it. You need to be breaking some glass and skinning some knuckles. Okay, maybe you're, you're lucky enough to have it in production. Woohoo! great job, and I mean that sincerely. If you're not, you need to challenge yourself and your team. What's your data strategy? And by the way, I put this together without seeing Tony's list, so we are wow. definitely a mono e mono here. Um, RPA, so future of operations. You know, the team, the business you're supporting. What, what are you doing in terms of, of IoT? Whether you're in financial services, or manufacturing, supply chain, services, you probably got some IoT that's in your future or in your, in your present, in your future. Um, what are you doing to digitize existing processes, new products? And by the way, you know, you heard about the Coca-Cola plant where the hackers took over the plant and ransomed the bottling plant because it had 30-year-old unsecured SCADA systems controlling the factory. Okay, do you have a, an OT strategy? Does your OT strategy have a security component to it? If it doesn't, gee, that, that, I'm not being sarcastic. You know, it's overdue. It's just a matter of time. No, nothing's gonna be more embarrassing than having the factory locked out or held for ransom. Not that that happens in the, in the modern world. Of course it does. And then finally, your people. What's this, the tech talent strategy? Not just for, the, for IT, but for the business. What are you gonna do to improve collaboration? Your people have more, you know, and, I, and when I say non-employees, do your employees have the ability to collaborate with non-employees, with people that are in your supply chain, that, that, that are transportation companies? You know, they're, they're as much part of the, you know, there's a need to collaborate with them. What are you doing to improve the flexibility of your workspaces to enhance employee engagement? You know, we saw some cool tech um, with some companies that had some new devices, new, new software to, to expand the connectivity of the mobile workspace. And then finally, you know, are you gonna step up personally and own the fact that we as a community have a training responsibility for the leadership team? Now, I'm just putting ideas out here, right? Yep. This is something, you know, I'm just sort of jotting ideas down and if I was um, on the other side of the table, you know, take out your red pen. The easiest thing to do is to correct somebody else's first draft and that's, that's what I challenge you to do. Um, well, Joe, your point about not just talking to your largest existing customers and talk to the emerging ones, Please. that's something that's relevant to IBC too, right? And that's part of the reason we come to these events because there's you know, more emerging firms that get involved in vendors and, and we learn from that and, instead of just serving the needs of five or six big companies. Mega, you've been to many conferences. Um, you were based in the Middle East for uh, a large portion of your career and we were you know, lucky to have you move over to Canada. Um, was there anything that surprised you about what wasn't discussed or, or anything along those lines? You know, you have a, a vast experience from other parts of the world. Okay, so uh, this onus about what I'm about to share also lies with us, uh, uh, the IDC presenters. I think the one thing that did not get discussed, which kind of surprised me, was KPIs. The most common KPI everyone said was ROI, that's great, but guess what, tech has more number of KPIs than just that, right? It's not just return on investments, but uh, take for example a retail company that uh, deployed an in-memory compute database. Yes, the CFO wanted the ROI because he wasn't happy with what the vendor charged them, but if you asked uh, somebody within the analytics team, what were your KPIs? They were talking about how fast I could actually uh, get the data together and actually present it to the board how fast pricing optimization was being done. So they had all these different metrics that they were presenting. Um, another important thing is actually also when we talk about security, um, to, to Joe's point that yes, a lot of people say that, oh my God, you spend so much on security. But if you ask somebody from the security team in terms of what are the different types of metrics you have to take onto the board, number of attacks that you have actually managed to prevent, how much downtime you have actually saved the organization, what is the cost benefit uh, that is taking place. I think uh, the one part we should have kind of 
uh, covered, and that's why I say the onus also uh, comes to us, is uh, what are the different types of metrics you want to take to the board? Marketing is not just about saying, look what we have done, but look, these are the different types of metrics you want to think about other than just cost, right? Other, yeah. If it's just ROI, then okay, there's not, not a lot of winning that's going to happen over there because ROI takes a time, uh, a good amount of time to materialize with tech. So, so we have an opportunity now, um, if anyone has any final questions, this is the last session. Um, Phil has the microphone. Any questions for the panel here? From the floor, this one. So I have a question. Um, one of, as you guys were talking about what we should do more and what is done less, and going back to the slide that Joe presented, I heard a lot of uh, during the panels. It's not about technology. It's not about anything. It's about people. And one thing that I haven't heard anything about is the leadership, because without the leadership, we can't have good people who can do all this stuff. So do you have any research or any insight into what is the future of leadership uh, to bring it all together, and what's the trend there? Joe, you probably have something. I'd like to start, and then yeah. I'll, I'll turn it to you, Nigel. Um, absolutely, I agree with you. I think you're spot on. Um, the future of leadership, the future of culture is a major component of change. Um, I actually chose not to put that on the to-do list because I was being more tactical. Um, but I thought along and long and hard about it, to your point. Um, one of the critical questions we all have to ask ourselves as part of our responsibility as, or, as leaders is are we grooming the people that are going to help the organization succeed? You can be the best leader in the world, but you don't have a span of control across 30 people or 300 people or 3,000 people in your organization. It's your teams of leaders under you. You're managing a team of leaders. So what are you doing to help those people develop? What training programs? What are you doing from a personal challenges standpoint? There's a lot that can be done. Yes, you can go off and spend money on training, but part of this is starting from the premise that I have a responsibility as a leader to mentor I, and, and, and do that on a consistent basis. And you know, I'll, I'll just ask right now, how many of you are in programs where you're formally mentoring other employees? Bravo. That's great. No, I mean, that is really awesome. So you're giving back. So I think that that makes a, a terrific point. Nigel? Uh, I'm just going to really, really quick comment saying um, day one, I was asked a question about what can Canada do. One of the drawbacks from a leadership point of view is that we have a very large proportion of our big companies are subsidiaries. And so if you're a leader in the subsidiary and you do well, what do you do? You move. Right? So Canada becomes a, a talent growth area that then is harvested and moved to the south or moved to Europe and may not come back and have our own, our own domestic champions, right? Instead of unicorns, we need more narwhals. And that is a problem as well, which is multi-dimensional, multi like government issues, competition in the market, equity, whatnot. And so that's an issue of how do we bring back the people who have uh, lead, led a, a, a global company, moved to say, SAP corporate, and bring them back to Canada and start our own domestic giants. And there's so few of them, right? Like you can think of Shopify in the tech sector. Um, Hootsuite, Ryan Holmes just remit and said he's resigning. Um, so how do we create more of those, not just in the tech sector, but tech-enabled business adjacent? So and that's tough. If I could, I just want to build on your point. So um, of all the cities that I've seen, one of the cities that has the biggest talent problems in North America is the city of Minneapolis. There's over a dozen large companies, and there are like 60 large organizations there. And I think the number is there's 94 tech people for every 100 tech jobs. Okay, wow. so literally, um, there is a perpetual shortage of IT professionals. And what they did, which I thought was, it plays exactly to the point you just made, they formed a group of business leaders, and then they went and raised money, and then they gave money to all the universities that had, were graduating engineering students and paid them to recruit engine, people who had graduated and moved away from Minneapolis with the thinking is those would be the best candidates, candidates to move to the northern tundra of Minnesota where it's 30 below Fahrenheit in the winter time. And by the way, it was very successful. So to your point, it's a strategy that's been tried and implemented with some success in other geographies. That's pretty cool. Um, I think there's another question on the floor here. Yeah, sorry, just a quick one. Uh, 
We have a diverse amount of industries that are represented here and we also geographically across the whole country. Your studies, did they represent like vast differences in needs and wants from one end of the country across the other or in industries based on some of the results you guys presented? Yeah, so, so I may as well go yeah, first. No. <laughs> so I run a lot of the survey panels for, for Canada. Um, we run our own survey house, so it, it's useful. We're not boring other people's data. Regional biases are, are largely formed by the corporate density in it. So if you think about the industries at play in different sectors, that's what's driving the regional differences. The one exception to that rule is Quebec. Um, the, the culture around initially dealing with um, not just the language, but also things like data privacy, what's the role of privacy, what's the role of the state to deal with data, was slightly different in Quebec than it is in some of the other regions. But by and large, the firmographics is the term we would use, um, that determines the relative maturity on almost every technology. So you see like the banks are really, really competent at dealing with architecture, at dealing with scale, at making things work at six nines. Um, you look at manufacturing, it's, it lags behind. You look at some of the other sectors that it changed. So we can look at all the different, and I'm happy to share some of that data with you, but, but it's, it's industry by industry and it's slightly size by size. The weird thing about size by size that I've always thought was cool, so large companies, obviously, they've got scale, they've got complexity, they've got governance, they know what they're doing, sort of, sometimes. Um, so you, you assume that they're the most, the highest adoption, and then it'll be mid-size, and then it's small. It's not. The companies in Canada that actually struggle are the ones who've grown to a scale and then plateaued. They hit 500 employees, somewhere between, say, 150 to 500 employees, and they stop growing. And then they just sit on the technology that brought them to 500 employees forever. And they're often family-owned, or they're privately held, and the owner's like, well, if I take my CapEx and put it back into your computers, that means I don't have another cottage. And there's all these personal drivers from the fact that they are in a place where they're benchmarking their success against the guy down the road. They need to be benchmarking their success, not against Toronto, against Chennai, Bangalore, Shenzhen, uh, Argentina. They're, those are the people who are eventually gonna eat their lunch. And in Canada, consistently, like we're talking like 10 years, 12 studies a year, the barbell of successes, big enterprise adopt stuff. Small business and fast growing business, they adopt stuff. <laughs> Mid-market's like, well think about it, we think of ourselves as fast followers. You're like, no, you're laggards in every way. Data, cloud, AI, uh, mobile devices of all things. And they don't realize how far behind they are because the, the guy at the Legion or downtown, we're doing great. So that is one of the big problems when I look at how the data plays out. And that's not regional. That's totally your company's trajectory. Great. That was great. Uh, thanks for your insights. Uh, I know it's just past 12. Food's being served. Uh, a few of us uh, have flights to catch. So I think we're going to wrap it up. Joe, you did have one final piece of advice that you, you mentioned earlier. I love that. Why don't you share it with the group? So. Uh you know, psychologists are people that sometimes are held in esteem and sometimes not held in esteem. So I offer this observation um, from a neutral perspective. <laughs> what, what a psychologist will tell you is that if you've been exposed to a learning and that if you don't act on it and internalize it within 24 hours, basically the odds approach 65% that you will never do anything with it. So the opportunity We've all been exposed to a lot of great things here. Some of us will embrace it and act. Some of us will embrace a few things. And a fraction of us will just let everything just drain off. Part of the reason for putting this single slide together, which you will get a copy of, is to try to help you by reminding you of this conversation and encouraging you to embrace and to, to actually act on what your priorities were from the event, not the ones that are on that page, but what your priorities are. Great, great advice, that's the call to action. So thanks Nigel, Joe, Mega for your insights and thank you everyone for engaging with us. It's been a, an awesome few days. So uh, round of applause to, to everyone. Thanks. <laughs>